بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمد ونصلي على رسول الكريم um, The book that we'll be uh, covering inshallah over the next uh, few months and there's a few books that we'll be covering on Islamic um, uh, business ethics or earning ethics The book that we'll be covering uh, we're starting today inshallah just briefly we'll start today and then um, we'll continue next week in a proper uh, fashion the, Today the Dars Quran went a bit extra because of the uh, those two pages of uh, Quran to go through. Um, this book um, uh, that is written by Imam Muhammad ibn Hassan Shaybani is considered the first book of its type in the history of Islam. Imam Muhammad ibn Hassan Shaybani was the student Imam Hanif rahmatullahi, one of his uh, top uh, two, like his protégés. Uh, he was a younger, uh, and Imam Abu Yusuf rahmatullahi, was the senior uh, student. But both were like his star. These are like his two. Uh, in themselves, they were mujtahid imams. Although they stayed under their teachers. Uh, think that, and one of the reasons the Hanafi madhab specifically exists as a madhab uh, is because Imam Muhammad and Hassan's writings. Two reasons there. One is Qadi Abu Yusuf, rahmullah, because he became Harun Rashid's, the Abbasid chief justice. Qadi al-Qudat, the chief justice, um, and the top judge in the land. So, of course, there was a state uh, sponsorship and then the judges that were trained, they were required uh, to be trained a certain way. So that's one way that he got established. And the other way, from a theoretical and academic point of view, was Imam Muhammad. So Imam Muhammad wrote many books. Um, and those books, um, so I'll read a little about him briefly. And then uh, about the book, Kitab al Kasb, which is a topic at hand. The uh, etiquettes of earning, uh, the, uh, the book of earning, literally that's what it means. But the etiquettes of earning, the ethics of earning, Islamic ethics. I asked Mufti Najib, some of you might know him, I called him, I said I wanted to teach a book. I did Fadal Tijara uh, last, in the last few months. And I said I wanted to do something which explains more about, which is also included in this book as well, the, which, which profession is more preferred. And he said don't teach transactions in your mosque. Transaction specific, this is Musharaka, this is Mudaraba, yet. Right? He said teach the principles of trade, the Islamic principles, the ethics first. Because a person that knows the ethics can quickly identify the problem areas in a contract themselves. Like they'll know something is fishy, right? They might not know exactly what it is, but if they know the principles, they'll be able to identify, yes, you have to know the transactions. But I put it like, see the problem with uh, Islamic quote-unquote finance today in the sense of that it's a good field, like it's important to need it. The problem is that the scholars or many of the scholars that are involved, except a few, they... Generally, when they go into that field of finance, then a lot of their time is spent in what boards of banks and so forth, right? So there's two things that had to be done. One is to teach the average person what he has to know in terms of the fardain for them, right? And putting the fard kifayat, the knowledge of this in the community's fard kifayat. Somebody has to know about this. So the community people, there should be some people that know about this type of business is halal or haram. But what happens when we go into the Islamic finance field, those ulama that I have teachers like that who are involved in that field, that generally they're not teaching, the, uh, many of them don't teach the average Muslim. Like, if there are Muslim, another example, a parallel field, halal, halal food, right? You know, for example, basically, like, what are the things that you know that are not halal, ingredients-wise? Four seven one, yeah, four seven one. There's a famous one, yeah, gelatin, right? There'll be certain things that you know that you will look on the back. Okay, that's not, you know, that's leave that. Uh, one twenty, one two zero is one one of the numbers. You know, it's a color made from an insect. It's muhtalafi according to some, but let's say it's made from an insect. As an example, certain things people, you know, you know certain things are haram, and you know quickly when you look at it. You know, when the ice cream is too colorful and too good, it's too good to be true, usually, you know, for us as Muslims. You know, like, we, we know, we, we, already have dis we already put our expectations very low. We try our luck, we turn it over, we have a look, but then, you know, we, are, we see the numbers, we see the ones that we should say. So you have a certain knowledge of halal food that you have learned from somewhere. Someone checked it. Could have been alim, not alim, or someone who's knowledgeable of the ingredients and decided to put the information out, you learn from that. But when it comes to transactions... Sometimes we don't spend the amount of time uh, that's required. So it's a simile. But what happens in that field as well? There are some ulama in that field who are, they are like basically certifiers. They're stamping product. They're sitting on the board. They are like they are getting paid by the company to certify their product. Conflict of interest? I don't know. 
Uh, it's a, you, you can tell me. So, you know, it's, it's a strange sort of thing. Then there's, the, it, you received a certain education, understanding of certain things are halal. A basic thing about zabiha, you have certain knowledge in your mind of what is acceptable meat, where should I get, you know, that what is it acceptable meat. Right? You have the knowledge of that. So that you, you have your own check, you have your own personal moral code and understanding. And it, we might be all at different levels of understanding, but you know that I have to consume halal, right? Same thing is in business as well. That um, uh, in business there are some ulama involved at the banks and uh, and so forth, but and certifying the products. But then there's a knowledge that you have to have because you're the one engaged in the you're the one like eating the food. Check it because you're putting it in your body. You're also engaging transaction so that if that money is haram that you earn through that, you have to know yourself that it's haram or not, right? If this money if, do I have to this money or not, right? Or the investment that I'm making is it halal or not? The way I'm doing it halal or not? So anyway, that's the, this, so this field is very important. We'll read in the moment why it's... Uh, so Imam Muhammad, who wrote the book, someone said to him, why don't you write a book, book on Zuhd? Right? Shaykh Fatah Bukhudda in the Arabic, if you can find the Arabic of this book, he does a very long muqaddama, which we don't have time to go through. A very beautiful muqaddama. And I just got parts of it here. I printed it out. Um, he said that, فَقَالَ إِنَّ الْإِمَامُ مُحَمَّدْ صَنَّفَ هذا الْكِتَابِ فِي الزُّهُدْ فلما فرغ من تصنيف الكتب قيل له ألا صنفت في زود والورا شيء فقال صنفت كتاب البيوع right Imam Muhammad was asked why don't you write you wrote books but at the end of his sort of his life after he wrote many books he said you didn't write a book on زود برغبة from دنيا in different sort of دنيا right living a simple life and spiritual life and so forth he said I wrote a book on بيوع Islamic transactions why because if you uh, the, the basis for um, uh, one of the, the ulama mentioned that that what are in your transactions fear of Allah in your transactions like you're worried whether your business transactions are halal or not acceptable to Allah or not is uh, um, and your, your earning is good and what you feed yourself and your family is good um, that you're rewarded for that this is a treatment and this is the head this is a start of zuhud right like you're praying, but you're the clothing that you have. And the hadith mentions that, isn't it? About the person, mat'a muharam, mushrub haram, his clothing. He's praying, Ya Rab, Ya Rab. He's asking Allah, Allah. But his clothing came from haram. The food that he ate came from haram. His disheveled hair, his hair is all messed up. He's dusty, right? On the outward, he looks like he's deserving this dua to be accepted. But all that he's wearing from head to toe and what's inside of him is from haram. He probably stole it or whatever, as an example. How Rasulullah said, how can his dua ever be accepted? How can such a person, although externally it looks like he should deserve the dua to be accepted. So, the, um, the, about the author, um, he is the Mujtahid Imam, the great uh, jury consult of Iraq, Abu Abdullah Muhammad al Hassan ibn al Farqa al Shaybani. His father was a people of Harasta, a town or suburb of the east of Damascus, Syria. Harasta is also the place where, um, this is like one of the places mentioned in this end of times. Uh, it's a significant place. I'm not sure. It's like in the countryside or in the city or it's a suburb now. But, uh, and he emigrated to Iraq where Muhammad was born to him in Wasit uh, in 748, uh, 131 Hijri. So this is very early uh, part of Islam. His father then took him to Kufa and raised him there. From an early age, he manifested profound intelligence and exemplary character. And he was a strong, healthy and handsome boy. He learned the Quran in Arabic language and attended classes. He's Shaybani, so he was Arab origin anyway. But then he like uh, excelled in Quran and Arabic language and attended class on Hadith. And when he was 14 years old, began studying with Imam Hanifa. He was quite young. He was a teenager. And he remained with him for four years, receiving instructions in fiqh and Hadith, after which he completed his education in fiqh under the guidance of Qadib Yusuf. So after Imam Hanifa, he continued with a senior student of Imam Hanifa Qadib Yusuf, who studied with Imam Hanifa for 30 years. Right, like extens extensive period of time. He had also learned from other great scholars of the time of Kufa, Basra, Madina, and Sham, such as Imam Sufyan al-Thawri of Kufa, Imam Uzai of Sham, and Imam Malik in Medina, with whom he studied for three years. Eventually, he became the foremost jury consult uh, 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 mufti of Iraq after Qadib Yusuf, and his scholarly accomplishments became widely known, which attracted many gifted and accomplished students to him and far from far and wide. Among some of his more prominent students were Imam Abu Abdullah, Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i um, and uh, founder of the Shafi'i legal school and Asad, uh, Asad ibn al-Furat al-Qairawini uh, uh, liberator of Sicily and the, do uh, the documenter compiler uh, of the Mudawwan uh, 
um, of Imam Malik legal school. It's a fiqh book of the Malik school. And Sheikh Sahnoon, the narrator, compiler of the Mudawwana, and many others. He was also in directly a great influence on in Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, uh, for he was once asked, for where did you acquire these legal subtleties? Whereupon he replied, from the books of Muhammad ibn Hassan. Among his prominent students too were Abu Ubaid Qasim ibn Salam, the celebrated author of Kitab al-Amwal, Book of Wealth, an early work on what we might know now term as macroeconomics or public finance. Imam Muhammad passed away in 804 in Ray, Persia. It is reported that he was seen weeping on his deathbed and he was asked the reason for that whereupon he said, what if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes me stand before him and ask Muhammad, what brought you forth uh, to me? Uh, what brought you forth to me? Jihad in my way or the pursuit of my good pleasure? What can I reply? Someone dreamt that Imam Muhammad after he passed away and asked about his condition, whereupon he said that he was forgiven because of his learning. Like there's never, like there's a part of, like he was an academic his whole life, but he missed, you know, like there's expeditions and there's uh, other works of deen that require sacrifice like jihad. He said, what if I'm asked that I didn't do that part of deen, right? It's like, and that's one of Sheikh, uh, one of the great Muballighs from India in the early 20th century. He said that when he, Allah tells Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi this is the end of his mission to make Tawbah and Astaghfar, right? He said that sometimes, he said, I spend my whole life in this one field, then I, I have to make Astaghfar and Tawbah, all the other things that are neglected. Sometimes when you specialize in something and you're good at something, you can't do everything. And because you can't do everything, there's a feeling that I'm missing part of deen that I've he didn't do anything wrong. He practiced all his deen. But in terms of work of deen, he couldn't dedicate because other because others did it, I couldn't do it. And he goes, I feel like I have to make a istighfar and tawbah for the things that I couldn't have done, even though I gave his whole life for Islam. He left behind a legacy of many valuable and well-received scholarly works, largely in the field of hadith and fiqh, based on the principles laid down in Imam Hanifa, such as Kitab al-Mabsud, Kitab al-Asal, al-Jami' al-Saghir, al-Jami' al he also compiled a book of traditions, Kitab al-Athar, in which he narrated mostly from his main teacher, Imam Hanifa, and from about 20 other teachers. Kitab al-Kasb, which is here translated in full, is considered to be his last work, which he wrote before he passed away. So that's important because you get the... When ulama mature, like you're getting the... Like Imam Ghazali, like for example, the book Bidayat al hidayah which is one of the last books of Imam Ghazali like you're getting a, the fruit of a person's life the end of their life right you're getting like right at the end like so, somebody said the other day some, as a criticism it felt like a criticism one of the sheikh oh he didn't talk like that 20 years ago like he was more hardcore I still have to reply to that whatsapp message you know like uh, <laughs> I say yeah, maybe because he's uh, uh, matured in 20 years which is a good thing like he's, there's actually more depth and wisdom in the words that he's saying now and he's more cautious he's not throwing people under the bus sort of thing like you know like everybody wants the khutbah nariya you know they, they love the fiery uh, khutbah but um, it's good for a certain purpose but a lot of damage has been done by those type of um, uh, things and if he's, if he's not doing that now and he's speaking much more measured tones not because of Mukhabarat or police, uh, he's working at the government now, no, not, uh, like the intelligence is watching him. No, because actually he's actually matured in his knowledge and he's got a much more wusa, vastness in his knowledge because he's looking at the whole picture and he's less critical, more inclusive of the various uh, um, understandings that are there in the Ummah, which are sta acceptable understandings. Perhaps one of the re reasons for, so we get a better, when an alim at the end of his life, he writes something, you get a, there's more, it's a lifetime of effort, it's like the juice, like the extracted right at the end, you know, like it's like the best part of their life, the most mature work that they have. Perhaps one of the reasons for the wide appeal of the Kitab al Qasim, and also prop, uh, perhaps of this work, his work, is the fact that the author was no ivory tower, armchair scholar, but one who was concerned about granting his legal conclusion, not only in textual evidence, but in the everyday realities of political, social, and commercial life. He wasn't just the, in the ivory tower of the acad acad academy in the university, in the jamia, in the madrasa. He lived the life among the people, understood how people were doing transactions. Right? Um, like he knew the realities, the ground level realities, how people are buying and selling. Right? And so, therefore, it wasn't just about establishing, oh, the Quran says this, the hadith says that. Yes. Of course, it's based on. But then, how do you implement that in this society, in this time, in his in his time? That how do you implement this, 
and in the reality in the ground how people are actually doing business. It's reported for him that he used to go out and visit the sabarun, the dyers, the one who dye cloth, in order to be able to ask them personally about their work and their transactions among themselves, like how to actually do trade business. Sheikh al Kothari um, documented this uh, report in his biography of Imam Muhammad, Mulugh al Amani, and commented in admiration look at this great mujtahid, that how he did not do, uh, make do with the knowledge that he possessed of the book and the sunnah and the opinions of the companions, followers, and others, other muftis of all the lands, but rather saw himself to be in need of being familiar with the manners of transacting, wujuhu ta'amul, among the practitioners of the trades, arbabu sina'at, and the difference between the manners of the old customs, al-urf al-qadim, and those of the fresh new customs, al-urf al-hadith, al-tari, that his words became, might be used uh, might be secured from errors in any aspects that pertain to the explication of the rulings of the divine law, the Sharia. Kitab al Kasb. Kitab al Kasb is in itself a small booklet expanding on the imperative um, of learning, earning a livelihood for those who are able to do so, and the various juristic and uh, ethico moral dimensions in respect thereof. The book is di di uh, dictated along the traditional authority uh, uh, rather than the strictly juristic fiqh approach to the topic. And hence, each legal position expounded on is supported by um, adducing one, two, or more hadith or reports, athar, and narrations of the akhbar from the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet, وسلم, and the followers, as well as the relevant verses of the uh, Holy Quran. The book was narrated and transmitted from the author by a student Muhammad ibn Samah al Tamimi, and he said his narration transmission, which formed the base of the commentary sharh on it by the learned and reader Imam al Sarakhsi. His commentary exhibits his sharh exhibits a remarkably nuanced, a commonsensical and um, a rational approach towards balancing between the different juristic interpretations of oh, it's quite long and goes on about the book, um, about the commentary Imam Sarakhsi. Just to you know Imam Sarakhsi, uh, he basically narrated like a 30 volume book while in prison. They put him in a prison, the, the local ruler was upset with him as happens all the cases, if the scholar speaks the truth. They're the counterbalance in our history, you know, to the corrupt rulers. The ulama is supposed to present that. And so they put him in jail, he put him in, jail in a well. So his students used to sit at the mouth of the well. They, they, he dictated from memory 30 volumes to them. That's called uh, Kitab al mabsut In the Hanafi fiqh, it's a masterpiece. I studied Kitab al-Siyam last year with my teacher from the UK. Um, it is a, it is a, and it is a masterpiece. It's amazing that a person can hold that much knowledge in his head and dictate it, um, dictate it to his student while in prison. Like we'll be lucky to, you know, like to get a sentence out properly in prison. He's dictating, like uh, expressing a whole school of thought uh, in an articulate way. And it's, it's, a, it's a masterpiece that's taught to students uh, today. Um, I'll just wrap up the, there's a lot of, uh, the Sheikh, the translators, they did a lot of explanation of the book. I won't go through, but Sheikh Abu Fatah Abu Ghudda, rahmullah, he says a few things and I'll just mention these points. We'll wrap up inshallah ta'ala because I've gone over the uh, time. I've got 18 minutes, so not too bad. Um, firstly, he said that these, the matters that is covered, Shaykh Abu Fatah Abu Ghudda in his Muqaddama, he mentioned these points. He, فَرْضِيَةُ طَلَبِ الْكَسْبِ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمْ وَبَيَانَ مَرَاتِبُ الطَّلَبِ مَعَ الْأَحْكَامِهَا That he explains the fardness, the compulsoriness that is being fard in seeking halal upon every Muslim. That is not an extracurricular activity, something extra you do and you don't do it. No, no. Seeking fard, uh, seeking halal earnings is a fard from the fara'id. Number one, and explain the levels of seeking and the rulings related to that. Number two is taking, using the means does not negate, negate tawakkul. Using the asbab. Al-akhdu bil asbabi la yunafi tawakkul. Taking the means, asbab, does not negate reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like you take a certain profession, job, right? So he, in the beginning of the book, he mentions that some ignorant people of our time, they're saying that, no, no, we have a tawakkul on Allah, so we're not going to do any work. Right? In his time, he's talking about. And there's, these people exist in all countries, I think, in all lands. Uh, right? uh, someone contacted me and asked me, he goes, should I just keep be taking from Centrelink and um, not work? See, that was an actual decision he was asking me. As a, uh, like as a, I can own, own a certain type of business and make money from it. I said, go do the business. I goes, firstly, you're taking it by lying. You know, we're not, like, this is haram. Like, if you're taking it by lying, it's haram, even if it's from a non-Muslim. Right, so you're stealing, and uh, someone said, like uh, during the uh, was it during the Iraq uh, the, the early 20, 
20 years ago, you know, 2003, whatever, he said, uh, the reason why I lie to Centrelink is because they're stealing the Muslims' wealth in Muslim countries, right? Someone said that. So someone, then I went to my father, Rahmanullah, and I asked, I said to him, uh, like someone said this, all right? And said that he goes, I'm stealing, I'm, I'm taking, you know, Robin Hoods, we got Robin Hoods in our community, because I'm taking from them. And the problem is, Robin Hood at least took from the rich, gave it to the poor. You're taking from them and putting it, giving it to yourself. You know, you're not giving it out to the Muslims, you're not giving it back to the Ummah, you keep it for yourself. My father said that, uh, since when did lying and stealing become halal? You know, like, uh, but anyway. Um, so taking, the, using the means, uh, like jobs and so forth, it does not negate reliance on Allah. Um, to, thirdly, the ibtalu ra'il karamiyah. There was a sect called karamiyah, and uh, he, this is what he said: ibtalu ra'il karamiyah wa qawmin min juhali ahli taqashufi wa hamqa ahli tasawuf min taharim al kasbi wa sa'i al rizq. So to negate the opinion of the karamiyah sect and the people from the ig ignorance who want to live like a very cold, harsh life, like they want to like mujahid themselves in tough life, and the foolish ones, not all people of the tasawuf. There's some stupid people among the people of Tasawuf, Hamqa, the idiots of Ahlul Tasawuf, isn't it? Is that the right translation? There's some among them that are foolish, that, uh, and, uh, who make it haram to earn. They said it's not allowed to earn. Um, and, uh, and they make it haram to go seek a, a sa'il risk, to strive to earn a livelihood. Number four, the types of earnings, anwa'ul makasib, wa tafadul fima baynahuma, wal khilafi dhalik. We went that through the other book. Types, different types of careers or jobs you can have, farming, um, business, uh, working for the government, teaching, whatever, there's different professions that can be done, and which one is more virtuous, and the differences between them. And that the earning a halal um, is a means of, uh, helps you in getting close to Allah. That any earning halal, earning a livelihood, makes you get close to Allah. And the five, masail infaq, the rulings of spending, spending on others, uh, and your family and others. Walhudud israf wal i'tidal fi kulli min ma'akil wa malbis wa maskan. And the limits of israf. Like when are you spending and then when are you going beyond like you're actually doing israf. Like it's not just about earning the money but also where you're going to spend it uh, as well. Um, in terms of food, clothing and whatever not. And the last point. Fadlu i'anati rajuli akhahu wa mata tajib ali i'anati wa mata la tajib. That the virtue of helping another man, your Muslim brother. Like when you aid the other person with money, obviously, right? Uh, with, with money, you help somebody like money, you've got money. When do you take your money and give it to somebody else to help out? Let's say family member or relative, whatever. And he goes, when it is wajib to help and when it is not. When it is not wajib. When is it necessary that you have to spend money and when it is not. So these are the, some of the points and these are some of the chapters that will be covered, inshallah ta'ala. We'll stop there. It's 23 minutes. It's supposed to be, I said, 20 minutes uh, each session. I apologize, went over the time today. So inshallah, next week we'll start the first page, first uh, section of the book. And part of that we'll read next week is about uh, the uh, different professions of the prophets. Uh, Imam Muhammad starts off with this. He starts with the different uh, w professions that prophets did. And it's very interesting when you listen to it, that how can it be something bad? Really, it can be a person has to be jahil to say that when prophets did jobs, then how can anybody say that a job is bad? You know, to earn a livelihood. Like, how can this is obviously a sign of the jahal of a person? So, inshallah, we'll go uh, through that next. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us understanding and tawfiq. And inshallah, Allah give us tawfiq to read this book and complete, inshallah, with khair. Amin ya rabbal alameen.